Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third day of our Reptile and Amphibian Days. My name is Hugo, and I'm an educator at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And let me ask you something. Is a better way to start the day than with an amazing presentation about reptiles? Well, let me tell you, the answer is no. So stop searching because you found the right place right here, right now. The talk this morning is herbs and conservation. But before we start, I have a question for you. Can you think of something you can do to protect reptiles and amphibians? We all love this animal. So I th just think about how can we help them? Maybe building houses for them, help them to cross the road or just leave them alone? You tell me. So write your answer on the chat. And while we are waiting for your answers, remember that during the presentation, if you need to use the closed captions, you can click on the CC button or follow the link that we are going to drop on the chat. Of course, if you have any questions, we want to hear them. So write them down on the chat and we will ask our experts. So let me see if we have any answers. So as Kelly said, I like to make tote boats for them. Advocate for land preservation. Let's see. Uh, Nicole said, stop using pesticides in your yards. Yeah, we're getting a lot of good answers. So, yeah, uh, Dale said, protect burner pools. Okay, so all these are really good answers, but I think that the most important is to learn about these animals and to know their needs and to help us and teach us all about these things. We have today a special guest, Dr. Megan Sear. Dr. Sear is, is a secretary for the North Carolina Herpetological Society. She has had a love for all reptiles and amphibians she, since she was an, in elementary school. Her day job is as an assistant professor at Merritt College where she teaches in the biology department. Good morning, Megan, and thank you for being with us today. How are you? Good morning. I am great. <laughs> are you ready for an amazing day of reptiles and amphibians? I certainly am. Okay, so I believe that you have great suggestions and a lot of things to show us. So I will let you take it away. All right. Welcome, everyone. So. I am here today um, to really just kind of showcase what I love. Um, so my day job is at Meredith College where I am right now. Um, but in the other times when I have free time, I love to talk about herps and I love to talk about conservation. I consider myself a conservation biologist. So I am representing the North Carolina Herpetological Society today. I have kind of three goals that I'd like to outline today. First of all, let's just start with what are herps? Why do they need conserving? And then I'm going to shamelessly plug um, joining the North Carolina Herpetological Society. So herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. And the guy who came up with a lot of our taxonomic system, Carl von Linnaeus, he didn't like them very much. And so he lumped them together. He thought that they were foul and loathsome creatures. He did not fully understand here. So interestingly, herp refers to to creep or to crawl, so creepy things, and ology is the study of. So as a herpetologist, someone who studies reptiles and amphibians. Now, Carl Linnaeus didn't like them very much, and he thought that there was, it was great that there weren't more of these foul and loathsome creatures. I personally feel very different, and also feel like they're not that much alike in many aspects. So in the chat on YouTube here, can you tell me what are some differences between reptiles and amphibians? So please answer on the chat, and we can read the answers. So when I think about reptiles and amphibians, for me, the first thing that I think is ones are on land and the other are on the water and land, but let's see what the people is going to say. By the way, we have on the chat uh, fans from, from uh, Meredith College. <laughs> to let you know. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Go Avenging Angels. Yeah. 
So let's see. Um, let's wait for the chat. But yeah, I think that, uh, so for example, Kerry said amphibians have an aquatic stage in their life cycle. Um, Aditha said amphibians can live both in land and water. Miranda said feed, uh, they'll, they lay their eggs in a different way. Grant said skin texture, we have tons of answers. So Megan, what is the right answer? Oh gosh, well, let's talk about some of the differences as we go through them today. Um, but those were all great answers there, right? There's lots of differences, right? And so one might even wonder what maybe this person was thinking, right? Um, when they lumped them together. Nonetheless, he decided to classify them together and the term has stuck around ever since. Herpetology, the study of reptiles and amphibians. All right, so let's start with our reptiles and let's start about some characteristics of reptiles that make them different from amphibians, right? Or just characteristics in general here. So reptiles are ectothermic. And so oftentimes we think of this as being cold blooded, but not necessarily that their blood is cold, but that they're relying more on the outside environment to maintain their body temperature. Reptiles have scales. So when we think about something as having scales, we think of that being more reptilian. Those scales can vary quite a lot as a something as opposed to an alligator or more smooth scales on something like an anole here. And yes, um, as I think it was Miranda pointed out, um, laying eggs on land is something that reptiles are going to be having. So this is a difference here that we notice right away. When we talk about reptiles and we talk about reptile and amphibian day, a lot of people immediately think about snakes. So snakes are wonderful reptiles. We have about 38 species here in North Carolina. Of those, only six of them are venomous. And in the Wake County area, really the only venomous snake you're likely to encounter um, is the copperhead. And so the copperhead is the one depicted here. I love to go on the greenway and go for walks. And I love herping, which is looking for reptiles and amphibians. And these are some of the ones I most commonly see on my walk. Um, so I do see some brown snakes, um, they're pretty small. They're kind of more like mulch snakes, garden snakes um, that I have depicted here on the right. Um, Northern water snakes, I see lots of snakes uh, when I go on the greenway over by the water area. Um, rat snakes, so here's our lovely black rat snake. Here's more of a juvenile one here. So I really love snakes, um, but I also really love all the different types of reptiles to kind of focus on here. So I just kind of want to give you a smattering of things you're likely to see here in North Carolina, particularly in the Raleigh area where Meredith is as well. We have lizards here in North Carolina. We have 12 species. Five of them are our skinks. So you might have seen a skink around your house, maybe even maybe gotten in your house, right? And then what's really cool in North Carolina is we have three species of legless lizards, right? So these are might look like a snake, but they are not snakes. Um, as depicted here on the bottom right, um, what you see is that they are lizards. So that you will see that they have eyelids like lizards have. They have an ear, a tympanic area, which you would not see on a snake. One of my favorite lizards um, is the green anole. Um, so you might also see these around in your backyard. Um, it's personally one of my favorites. And that guy in the beginning who didn't really like reptiles and amphibians very much, he was very popular with coming up with scientific names. So you might have seen on the previous slide some scientific names here. Here's another scientific name for the green anole, which is Anolis carolinensis. So immediately I'm automatically thinking of Carolina, but this is actually named after him and his naming system. All right, so we have snakes in North Carolina. We have lizards in North Carolina. We have alligators in North Carolina. People don't always aren't aware of that, especially if they're new to North Carolina or they're just visiting here. They might not recognize that this is the northernmost range just about for where we can find North Carolina um, alligators in uh, North Carolina. So these are some pictures that I took in the Wilmington area of an American alligator. These are alligators we have here. And then again, alligator Mississippiensis, right? Cool kind of name that we have here. 
And then of course, turtles, my good friend who does a lot of herpetology education and outreach, um, Miss St. Clair loves turtles. We have 21 species. Four of them are marine, so they are nesting on the coasts of our beaches here. They belong to the family Chelonidae. And in fact, we have a state reptile. And our state reptile is the eastern box turtle. I really am particularly partial to box turtles. I think they're lovely to see. We have one. This is the one that hangs out in our yard from time to time. Um, and these are just different examples of herbs that I've taken um, throughout our state, different pictures. So we have turtles in North Carolina. All right, so now that we've kind of focused on this, we've been focusing here, we've mostly been focusing on reptiles, all on reptiles. Now let's get to our amphibians. So what are some different types of amphibians? Maybe some that you've seen this year or last year. I'll give you a few moments to put some stuff in the chat on YouTube. Sure, just write it down on the chat. And while we're waiting, I have a question for you. Again, first of all, on your walks, what is the most excited, exciting animal that you have found? They said, oh my God, I thought that I will never see this one. Mm, gosh, that's kind of a tough one. Um, I guess for me, um, because they're sometimes hard to find and we'll talk about them momentarily is finding a salamander. Uh, salamanders are one of those things that sometimes even people mistake for lizards. Um, and I was very excited to find a salamander, especially because I hadn't seen one um, out in the wild of this species um, until we got um, to North Carolina. So I moved here about 12, 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we have a question from Katrina, actually, um, related with Meredith College. They are still involved with the turtle pulp or at least planning to resume in involvement once the pond is restored? Yes, very much so. Yes, yeah, so we have a pond that's being restored um, here on Meredith's campus and we will continue to be doing that um, and hopefully looking and monitoring the populations and looking for any um, species that don't belong there as well. Okay, so let's see some of the answers on the chat. So Katrina said mutes, frogs, toads, salamanders. Jay said Sicilians. Wow. Um, Ashley has seen Eastern box turtles and Alice frogs. Great. And Meg cool. is not sure that she has seen a lot of reptiles, but she is not sure what did she saw. Yeah, so when it comes to amphibians, we have lots of different types here. We have frogs, toads, salamanders, which include newts. And yeah, it's great that someone mentioned Sicilians. So Sicilians um, don't look a lot like your classic kind of amphibian here, but they are definitely a type of amphibian. Not found in North Carolina, um, but found definitely um, in other regions of the world. So. Amphibian, as someone pointed out in the beginning, means living both. It means both water time on water and land. So the word amphi means to switch, right? Ectothermic, so they are also cold-blooded, right? And again, it does not mean that their blood is cold. It means that they rely more on the outside environment to regulate their temperature. And yes, they need water to reproduce. They have a cycle when we think about it and they need a wet, more wet environment. And another thing to think about with amphibians is a lot of them breathe almost exclusively through their skin. So very different than a reptile which has scales. Okay. So again, as someone pointed out, that amphibians have a period of metamorphosis. So most amphibians, when we talk about this, have a life cycle where they're metamorphosis. And metamorphosis means change, to morph, to go through some type of change. And so we know we might even have seen jelly-like eggs that they possess. And there's huge changes. They grow limbs, right? They grow, their whole gut gets reworked internally. They have from go from having gills to having lungs. They grow teeth, different types of teeth, 
right? All of these changes are occurring. And in fact, a lot of them start out as things like tadpoles, and they go from being herbivores, eating plant material, to being carnivores and eating insects. So they have a complete change in their diet. So a lot of changes occur with metamorphosis. And here's kind of a classic example here, right? With our adult frog, and we had our tadpole stage here. All right, so let's talk about all the amphibians that we can find in North Carolina. So salamanders, we have the most salamanders in the world. That alone should be a reason to just absolutely love living in the state of North Carolina. We have 64 known species. And again, species are different types. And North Carolina is home to seven different families, so major categories of salamanders. And a lot of them are what's called plethodon today. And what that means is that they are lungless. They don't have lungs. That's pretty cool, right? They're relying on their skin for the exchange of gases like their oxygen and carbon dioxide. And so it's pretty cool to think about these really cryptic things. A lot of times people mistake them for lizards, right? People don't often see them. I was so excited on the Greenway to see this salamander here, right? So this was taken over in the Cary area here. So this is a redback salamander. So we have lots of different salamanders in North Carolina. In fact, we have a state salamander. We are the only state that I know of that has its own salamander. That might not be true. Maybe I need to look a little further, but as far as I know, we are the only state with our own state salamander. And it's the marbled salamander. It's a beautiful, chunky salamander. It is what is known as a mole salamander. Um, they are very, spending a lot of time towards the ground here. Not always seen, um, but beautiful. And so this is our state salamander that we have here in North Carolina. And these are pictures that I have taken um, a little bit outside of the Raleigh area. All right, so now I want to ask you, what's the difference between a frog and a toad? And it's kind of, some things have already kind of come up here on the slide here, but can you think of anything else? What's the difference between a frog and a toad? So guys, what do you think that is the difference? Because they look very similar. And I have to tell you, Megan, so the marble salamander is the logo that we are using for this year, uh, Reptilian Amphibian Day events. So it's beautiful. And related with the salamanders, uh, we have a question from the chat is, where do you find them? Uh, do you have any trick? Yeah, so you have to be pretty careful with the salamanders and be pretty patient. Um, so under a little, wet logs, um, so little loggy areas, wet environments. Right now, I've seen some egg masses. Um, so you can see the egg masses out towards certain areas. They're very temporary vernal pools and ponds. Um, my key for salamanders is patience um, and not spending time on the ground. So as a herpetologist, I spend a, time, spend a lot of time looking down. I hang out with some bird people, so ornithologists, and they spend a lot of time looking up and I spend a lot of time looking down on the ground. Okay, so we are getting now the answers. So what is the difference between frogs and toads? And we have here that toads are terrestrial. Toads are bumpy. Nicole said all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. And I think you said frogs are aquatic. They lay, they, their eggs looks different and toads have dry, watery skin. So what do you Great. think? Yeah, so we kind of have a little bit of blurred lines here, right? There are species we call true frogs, right? And so they would be classified as the true frogs and we have species called true toads that belong in true toad categories. But then we have kind of blurred lines. And so I like the expression that, you know, all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. So we kind of send a little bit of difficulty here. Take, for instance, if you've ever been to a pet store, you might have seen a common pet called a fire-bellied toad, yet it spends its whole time in water, right? But in general, what we tend to think about is that frogs have maybe more moisture skin. Um, they have very strong back legs for jumping. 
Toads have more dry, they tend to be more terrestrial, so less tied to water. True toads have what's known as a par parotid gland here, which is a poison gland that excretes poisons here. So that would be something as a difference between a true toad. So let's talk a little bit more about the frogs and toads in North Carolina. We have a state frog. Our state frog is personally to me the most beautiful looking frog. And when it comes to frogs, we have about 30 frogs and toads in North Carolina. This is our state frog. And while it is the most beautiful looking, it's not necessarily the most beautiful sounding. So let's hear what it sounds like. All right, so maybe more of a nasally honky cowbelly kind of sound here, right? But what's really cool about frogs is that oftentimes we can recognize them simply just based on hearing them. So I hear a lot of frogs when I walk on my greenway, but I don't always see a lot of them, but I can recognize them based on their call. And I'll be talking more about frog calls on Friday um, for those who are interested. All right, so I've been really just giving you a snapshot of all the cool animals, reptiles, and amphibians that we can find in North Carolina. And I want to transition now to why do they matter for two terms here, conservation and biodiversity. So let's back up a little bit. In the beginning here, Hugo, who introduced me, said, what does it mean? What do you want to protect? And when we think of the word conservation, that's kind of what we mean, right? We mean we want to protect these species. And not only do we want to protect those species, we want to protect the land. Conserve means to keep, right? We want to keep things. And so we want to keep the reptiles and amphibians we have in North Carolina. And this relates to biodiversity. Bio means life and diversity, different types. And it's not that we just have different types. We don't just care that we have different types of species. We care about how many of those species we have, right? We don't want to lose the fact that we might have hundreds of one species, right? And when we talk about biodiversity, we talk about conserving and keeping and protecting not only for um, the environment, but for us as well in all kinds of reasons, right? So here we have biodiversity. So we want to keep all the different types of species of frogs and reptiles and all these things, and we want to conserve and protect them. North Carolina is actually considered a biodiversity hotspot, particularly the mountains of North Carolina. It's an area that's really high in diversity, lots of different species, and they're being threatened with destruction from various ways. Some of the species we have in North Carolina are endemic. And what that means is they are found nowhere else in the world. They might be found in just a small little ravine in one little area of our mountains. Or here, the Yonalusi salamander might be found only in one little particular region near Grandfather Mountain, right? So endemic means they're found nowhere else in the world. And so if we lose them here, they're gone forever. And so why do reptiles matter, right? They matter a lot. They regulate snake populations. Everything needs to eat, so they're really good at eating other things. Many snakes eat rodents, so they can keep rodent populations down. Some rodents can carry diseases, like Lyme disease, and so by keeping the rodent population down, we can help prevent disease even in humans. Lizards are also good at eating a lot of insects, and so that's good. I particularly don't always like all the insects at certain times. I like them in general, but not always. They also serve as food for others. So other things need to eat them like birds of prey, right? Big birds. And then what's really cool about some of our um, venomous snakes is that um, cardiovascular drugs, drugs for the heart have actually been derived from snake venom. So one of the major diseases to help regulate people's heart and the pressure of their heart actually was derived from a snake venom. So reptiles really matter. And amphibians matter too, of course they do. Amphibians eat insects, 
They also serve as food for predators. Many salamanders are known as detritivores. They eat dead decaying matter, right? So they help recycle the nutrients in an ecosystem. And salamanders can actually, as rare as they are to find, make up a huge part of the biomass, the energy produced in an ecosystem. So they can be a huge factor. We might not always see them ourselves, but they're there playing an important role. They need our help. So why do you think reptiles and amphibians need our help? So what do you guys think? I mean, I love all kinds of animals, so I don't like to see them disappear. And what you said is very important that we have that opportunity here in North Carolina to see some endemic species that not everybody can, can see. Definitely. And we need to protect them. So, and actually I have a question. Um, when we see these animals on the wild, because we are humans and we like animals and we love to pet everything that moves, uh, we always try to pet them. What is your advice about that? Well, it depends on what it is and what you mean by petting. Um, so for me, I know with salamanders um, that, you know, you can be concerned because they could pick up a disease or something. It's also not always good to pick things up with our hands, especially if something's breathing through their skin. We don't want to transmit anything here. So when I see something that I want to touch in the wild, I actually generally carry um, some disposable um, non-latex gloves with me. Um, but generally, um, if I see something like a snake, I, as long as I know that it is um, a snake that's not going to be venomous, I would go ahead and pick it up. I would show people, but I would put it back exactly where I found it. That's the other concern is some of, some of the reptiles and amphibians I've talked about today um, have a very specific um, home or site where they live, their habitat and their environment. But if we move them, they can be very confused and disoriented. Mm -hmm. So let's see, why do these animals need or help. So for example, Aditya said that they are losing their habitat or ginger the same, the destruction of their spaces, um, Alice habitat destruction. Um, Crystal said the reptiles and amphibians don't make laws and regulations, yeah. but people do. <laughs> um, but mostly is that humans, we are destroying their habitat and of course, the world. Yeah, so we are, right? Many species of reptiles and amphibians, we noticed are in decline, that we are losing numbers of them. And so we're worried that we might lose them forever, right? Especially if they're endemic and only found here in North Carolina. Most scientists and conservation biologists say that habitat loss is the number one thing. We simply just don't have the habitat. Pollution is another example, right, where things become degraded, um, where pesticides can be released, as some people said in the beginning of the conversation. Invasive species. So as a conservation biologist, I work with invasive species. And invasive species means it's not native to the area um, and it's causing harm. So an invasive species would be introduced here from someone else, maybe accidentally, maybe through the pet trade, and then it gets out and maybe it starts eating things that other species need to eat, or maybe it's a stronger competitor. We are good, unfortunately, at modifying our waterways. So many amphibian species need certain waterways and they need certain very clean, pristine water. Road mortality. So that happens, right? We see that unfortunately roadkill happens. The exotic pet trade. So people take them because they think they're great and they wanna keep them inside or they wanna trade them in other places. And again, disease can spread that way. And then, you know, unfortunately there are a lot of things that Carlos Linnaeus guy didn't like them. And I don't, I didn't inherit that. I don't know why he couldn't have imagined them soon being as awesome as we do, um, but some people just don't like them. Um, and there's a lot of myths about them, right? That get perpetuated and a lot of fear as well. All right, what can you do to help, right? So I am part of the North Carolina Herpetological Society. As I was introduced from Hugo, I am secretary. So I would strongly encourage you, if you have not heard of us, to join. But just briefly, has anyone heard of the North Carolina Herpetological Society? Are you a member? 
Well, I think that if they're not a member, there's a good time to do it. And actually, I have to say that um, the North Carolina Herpetological Society is a big asset for the Reptile and Amphibian Day. They are with us every year. They are great. And the, the job that they are doing, it is amazing. Just only just spreading the knowledge and the love for these animals and how to help them. I have to say the thank you about, about that. I will also say that we are very also tightly linked with the museum um, and many, um, many people in with museum and the staff also are very familiar. Many people who work the museum are also part of the North Carolina Herpetological Society. So we have people on the side that said that they are members. Awesome. And that they are not members, but they are going to be. Great. So that's great. Um, so I want to just talk briefly about who we are, what we do. The best way to become a member, and I will talk about this again, is through our ncherps.org. And we are a 5013C nonprofit organization. Um, the mission of the North Carolina Herpetological Society is pretty simple. It's amphibian and reptile conservation through education and research. So we have a great logo that is our box turtle, our state reptile. Again, this is through ncherps.org that you can sign up. What we do, we do a lot. We do a lot of education and outreach. That's one of the things I love to do. That's why I'm here today, right? I love talking about reptiles and amphibians. My day job, I love doing as well, but this is a chance for me to really share my love of these wonderful creatures. So maybe you've seen us before. Again, we're usually at Reptile and Amphibian Day when it is um, a day in person. Um, we have several speakers through the North Carolina Herpetological Society that are talking virtually this week. You might've seen us at other other events in and around the state of North Carolina. We have a grants program so people can apply for grant funding for money to do their own herpetology research on reptiles and amphibians. We have land projects, so projects that work towards conserving, protecting land. We have a stewardship. Um, so we have members um, and chair Ed Corey who does um, stewardship and so we try and protect areas, we clean up areas that we have property on. We answer animal husbandry questions as well. So we have people linked with the museum um, here that will also help you um, with husbandry questions. We have a library and archives. So we have record of all of our Herp Society meetings, all of the things that we have done through the years. And we do a lot, lot more that I probably would start to bore you on if I talk too much about it, but we do a lot. And so we do have a website. Again, this is the best way to get a hold of us. This is where you can become a member. We also have a herp shop. So you can buy really cool gear like this awesome t-shirt with different uh, reptiles and amphibians. Um, you can stay up to the date on our upcoming events. And again, you can contact the officers. Again, I am the secretary. You can contact me if you have questions or comments. We also have a Facebook page um, for those of you interested in going that route as well. So what do you receive? Why, why should you become a member, right? Well, one, you get discounted meeting registration. We tend to have two meetings a year. There is a quarterly newsletter hosted by someone else who works at the museum, Jeff Bean, Mr. Bean. There is a photo contest. So all these great pictures you, could, you find on the Greenway, right? You could go ahead and enter those in our contests. You get email updates. We have volunteer requests. So if you're very herp knowledgeable and you know all the things I've been talking about today and then some, please sign up to also share your love of reptiles and amphibians. And again, we do tend to have two meetings a year, one in the spring, one in the fall. Our next virtual meeting is going to be virtual. It's April 24th and there will be details on our Herp Society webpage. Generally, our spring meeting is held throughout the state. It's a great chance to get to see different regions of the state, learn from other herpetologists. And our fall meeting is almost always, and it's generally held in Raleigh, generally at NC State University, um, where I'm also an alumni from, so go Wolfpack. And what's also great about our meetings is this is a chance to be and see herpetologists in action, and we go on field trips. And that's sometimes a highlight for many people because they wanna see these herps as they are in the wild, these herps that are so valuable to our environment. We have a youth branch. 
So we have those for a younger generation. We also have a youth branch um, Facebook page. The youth branch is divided into two groups, the Polywog Club, referring to tadpoles, which is eight to 11, right? And then our youth branch, which is ages 12 to 18. Some younger can also fit in there, um, but we have a youth branch, so families are welcome to sign up. And our current youth branch president here is Veronica. All right, so hopefully today I told you what are herps, and why do they need conserving, and a little bit about our North Carolina Herpsological Society. With that, I am happy to take any questions you might have. Perfect, so we are going to the questions. By the way, I am glad that you uh, clarified because we were having questions, what about with my kids if they, if they have something to, to do? So yes, so you have things for all the ages. Yes, definitely. And our, um, our youth branch, a lot of things have been virtual, um, but I just recently, last month, gave a talk about salamanders. Um, so very perfectly themed here um, to the youth branch. And when things um, are able to resume, we will definitely continue to have um, some of our outdoor events that we've hosted as well. Mm -hmm. So let's go with some questions from the chat. Um, for example, when we handle amphibians, how do we handle them correctly so we don't mess up their skin slash breathing process? Um, so as you can see here, this is someone who is holding um, a toad. Um, and this would be a perfectly fine, good example. You wouldn't want to pick up with their legs or anything. The concern um, mostly with reptiles and amphibians was if you were to be holding multiple ones and not washing your hands in between um, or going to a different area, that kind of thing. Also with some of our frogs and toads, they can be slightly noxious to us. So if you were to hold like a Cope's gray tree frog and then rub your eye afterwards, it might not be the best idea, right? We also are being a little bit concerned about maybe carrying diseases, right? So it's always good to have some type of field way to wash your hands. For me, um, when I go herping, I am very cognizant about taking my field gear to another place. So I always rinse my boots with a 10% leech solution um, before I go on to any other kind of site or place, just so I'm not traveling anything. I'm just trying to protect these as best as possible. Mm -hmm. So we were talking before about these medicines that are, yeah. uh, so we have a question said, are these venom based medicines um, derived from venoms uh, that affect people in raw form. And what are some examples of the snakes used for this? Um, so the, the first part is, um, so this case, it came from a pit viper um, in Brazil um, and it was, um, the snake venom was used for a blood pressure medication um, to lower blood pressure. And so what it does is it just expands um, the blood vessels so that the blood pressure can drop. Is that the question that they were asking? I think so, yeah. Okay. And some snakes, as an example, that they are used for, for, this, uh, for these medicines? Some snakes, um, so yeah, so it would be pit vipers in Brazil would be mostly, okay. yeah. That is the most one. Okay. Yeah, there has um, been some research on copperhead venom, um, but the medication that would be used um, actually would be a cancer medication has not come um, to case yet. So it's still in trials, case studies. Mm -hmm. And related with the previous question uh, about how to handle the, these, these animals, are latex gloves an issue with amphibians skin or do we typically use non-latex gloves uh, due to human allergies? Mostly to human allergies, yeah. Mm -hmm. And about the society, is only for North Carolina or people from South Carolina can join? We have members who are outside, um, so anyone can join. We've actually had people apply for grants. Um, so you do not have to live in North Carolina to be a member of the North Carolina Herpetological Society. Great, and um, what is your advice for all our viewers about the future of reptiles and amphibians? What is your, so is there any trick that you can share with them? to help all these animals? I think spreading the word that they matter, right? That 
that education about them matters, that, you know, education is kind of the first stop to fear. I think a lot of people still have fear, right? I know people in my own family, to be honest, who probably wouldn't want to see my presentation today because they're that afraid of snakes. Right. And I just wish, you know, that in the beginning, it's OK to be afraid, you know, afraid of something, but you need to protect it. We don't want to hurt them. Right. So I say a healthy respect. Right. So I think that's my greatest advice is just being aware that we have some beautiful biodiversity in North Carolina that deserves um, protecting and conserving. Yeah, actually, that I want to add is we, we love when it's uh, the Rock Island Feeding Day in person. So I hope that the next year that, that we can do it in, in person and see all these visitors that come having their questions and, and doubts about, mm, do I like snakes? Do I like amphibians? Maybe yes, maybe not. But when they leave the, the museum and say, I love them. Yeah. And I think that that is a great job because we try to teach and make them understand and learn because sometimes our fears comes from the lack of knowledge. Yes, and, it, and it's okay to be afraid as long as we're not causing harm, right? Um, it's okay to, to still have some uncertainty, right? And so I have converted some of my family um, and they know what I do um, and they know that I you know, have snakes at home. Um, and what they know is that you know, that's just her thing, right? And so as long as we're not causing harm, as long as we are trying to educate others and protect, and we acknowledge that some people maybe not, not be as familiar. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from the chat. Are there any specific um, legislative or other initiatives that NCHS is advocating for right now? Um. So we have lots of different side projects um, that we constantly advocate for. Um, we have a project bog turtle. Um, so bog turtles, which I didn't show you. Um, are you know very um, precious to our area? Very very small turtles um, that can be protected. Um, we have a project Simus, so referring to a hognose snake. So we have other kind of projects, and we just have other ongoing. Um, pushes for as far as um, land conservation. We know that there's certain land that might become available for us to help or either partnership with as far as protection. Mm -hmm. And could you discuss issues with chytric fungus infecting salamanders and amphibians? And do we have that fungus in North Carolina? Um, so there are two primary fungi um, that was maybe referred to. Um, and one is um, an acronym of BD. Um, and this is primarily more of a frog fungus um, that is prevalent in North Carolina. It's pretty much prevalent all over the world. They can impact certain populations depending on the species. Not been so much of an impact here in North Carolina that we suspect, though that's not to say that it could be a contributing factor to decline. The other one is a newer fungus um, known as B-cell, Bactridium and salamandivorans. B cell has not reached North Carolina, and hopefully it doesn't. We are very afraid about this fungus um, impacting salamanders um, because um, it has wiped out populations in places in Europe and Northern Europe, particular salamander populations. We've done studies um, in North Carolina and different states looking at our salamander populations and testing them in the lab. And we have seen that some of our salamanders like our newts could be very susceptible to this disease. So we're very concerned about it reaching here. There's monitoring. There's actually been changes um, outlawing certain salamanders to be brought into the United States to help prevent this. Some of us are maybe a little more pessimistic that it's just a matter of time. I'm an optimist. I think most conservationists are optimists. That's why we're in this. We think that there is a good outcome. And I am really hoping um, that it does not reach here to North Carolina, especially because we have so many salamanders that could be impacted. Yeah. So I don't see more questions on the chat. So I think that it's time to wrap up, but uh, I have to say that Dr. Uh, Sierra is going to be back with us on Friday yeah. at two. Yeah. I am I'm right, okay, with an, another amazing presentation this time about the, the frog songs. Frog songs, yes. So that one you heard today, the Pine Barrens, I'll be doing all different kinds of ones. So maybe we're going to hear like the new versions of songs of Madonna or something like that in frog version or something. 
<laughs> okay. So again, uh, Megan, thank you so much for being with us today. I think that now we understand more these animals and how to help them. So again, thank you very much. And thank you all for attending this program. But remember that this was the first one today, but it's not the last one. We have tons of programs during the rest of the day and the rest of the week. So for the coming up programs, check out our website, naturalsciences.org and click on Reptile and Amphibian Day for more information. And um, if you're a member, Thank you so much for being a friend of the museum because your support let us create programs and events like this one. And if you are not, maybe this is a chance for you to join. And if you do it now during the Reptile and Amphibian Day, you can get a free Reptile and Amphibian Day t-shirt with the marble salamander that Dr. Sear was talking about. That is yes. beautiful. And we have tons and tons of colors. So again, it's a deal. And again, thank you so much, Megan, for being with us. Thank and you. My pleasure. You. Mm -hmm. And thank you, everybody. And I hope to see you in another presentation. Bye-bye, everybody.